Welcome to Moon Monkey. This episode we're going to be talking about Tokyo Godfathers, directed by Stoshi Kon, who worked on films such as Perfect Blue and Paprika. So, Tokyo Godfathers is a feature length animation and it was based off of a John Ford Western called Three Godfathers, which was three bandits who discover a baby and take care of it. We've not seen the John Ford version, but no. there's a bit of background about it if you if you like Tokyo Godfathers or you like the John Ford version, maybe this will be your cup of tea too. Um, but it was a, a very kind of different story because it's not it wasn't three bandits. You've got three different kind of people. You've got a kind of alcoholic called Gin, um, and you've got a middle-aged transvestite called Hannah, and you've got a teenage runaway Miyuki. And they're all homeless as well, so it's a very kind of different story. Um, and I feel like it's it's a re- it's a really kind of feel good film. Yeah, it's uh, a good Christmas film. Yeah. It has that Christmassy vibe to it. It's got a kind of Christmas miracle with kind of Tiny Tim or Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, but it's not it's not it's not like it's a Wonderful Life. It's a very kind of soppy film. Yeah, but it's basically like the the three homeless people struggling to survive in the streets of Tokyo find an abandoned baby on Christmas Eve and it's do they keep the baby for themselves which which Hannah the the transvestite character wants to do because it's what she's always wanted. She's always wanted to have a baby or he's always wanted to have a baby. Uh, so is that kinda is that kinda parallel are they gonna keep are they gonna keep the child and raise yeah. it? Because they are kinda family in their own way. Yeah. Or are they gonna give it back to its to its own parents. Yeah. So that's the kind of Well, try and, try and find the parents because they yeah. don't know who the parents are. Because that's been abandoned, are. yeah. Yeah, so they, yeah, with the baby, they find a key to a locker, which is a clue to where the parents might be. And I think yeah. they find a photograph in the locker and then they basically, that sets off a whole series of events of them trying to track down these parents uh, to just, to, so they can hand back this baby. But throughout the film, as well as that, there are a lot of other uh, things going on so I thought each of the characters uh, was kind of really well-rounded and they all had their own story going on. So uh, as you say, we had Gin, who was kind of a drunk and a gambler and that's how he'd ended up on the streets. So throughout the thing, he's kind of hoping for a kind of redemption, I guess, from his family because he feels bad. I guess he's kind of... Yeah, he's kind of changed his... No, he hasn't really changed his ways at all. But I think he, f- he think he feels bad for what he did and how he ended up in that situation because he's lost his daughter, obviously, and lost his wife uh, through this. Like, he's ended up there. They've, I think they kicked him out or something. Uh, you've got the other character, Hannah, who's a transvestite, who, again, kind of has her own thing going on. Uh, and Miyuki, again, is a runaway from her family, so she has her own thing going on. But I thought, like... Uh, the three characters we had uh, were really interesting because they're not, like you say, they're not a, they're not typical heroes. No, like it's a very kind of different subject matter. Like it being three homeless characters, like it's completely different yeah. to like the the western that was based off of allegedly. Uh, but so it's yeah, it was a very kind of different because it's kind of about maybe like basic human decency, like talk, but, but showing it. Yeah. Three people you kinda get in society a, that you wouldn't necessarily yeah. assume. You kind of get an unusual family dynamic, though, with these three, with a like a mother, a mother who's a transvestite yes. man, and a father, and the runaway girl is sort of like their surrogate daughter. Yeah. And then when they, they find the baby, that kind of brings them. Yeah, it's, not, it's already a family, together. but it's like more of a family with yeah. the baby added. It's just an un, yeah, kind of unusual family unit. Uh, but yeah, I thought the yeah the characters in it were really good. Yeah, and it was interesting that the that it was that the that the characters were homeless and it was like based off of things that other films wouldn't consider talking about or using. Like yeah, I hadn't really seen anything where three homeless people were the 
the kind of stars of the of the film or no. the main characters. No, that's. The I thing. can't really think of another one <laughs> that is a that is a homeless character as the hero. Yeah, the that's true. They do. It does kind of yeah tackle some difficult issues, yeah. but like it, again, it doesn't feel particularly. It's not shut like, down your throat like the yeah. Kind of, it doesn't even feel particularly depressing because there's like a great sense of humour in the film, a lot of comedy. Yeah, it was so funny. Uh, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of it was really funny. A lot of jokes, even though it's something which could have been like a depressing subject matter, uh-huh. uh, but they tackled it with good humour. Which, not to say, like there are scenes in this film which were tragic. Like there, are, there is death in the film. There's. Yeah, a murder in the film. Like, there are some dark things, yeah. but, like, throughout it, it still manages somehow to keep it light. Like, I think they did a good job of balancing, like, the dark and light in the yeah, film. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's like a... Like, you'd maybe associate animation with a kid's film, like, a feature-length animation with kids. And I wouldn't say this is a kid's film. Yeah, the film's definitely not a kid's film. I think it's... Uh, basically, the directors tried to make this... Yeah, when you're watching it, it doesn't seem like he's gone for easy options. He's directed it as though he was directing a live-action movie. Like, I was thinking, especially towards the end of the film, like, this could have... Aside from maybe one scene that I can think of, the whole of this thing could have been done live-action. There's nothing yeah. really that's fantasy or that you really needed to do this animated. But the animation does, does add a lot, I guess, to the feeling and the atmosphere of the film. Uh, but I thought the direction was really good by Satoshi Kon. Uh, previously he's worked on other films like Perfect Blue I think was his first uh, Millennium Actress and Paprika his final film uh, with all his other films uh, they've got a lot more weird weird plots either being set inside people's minds or featuring things which are fantastical and there's a lot of meta meta narratives and things going on and a lot of uh, commentary on the world of film and the world of directing in the films. Whereas this one was really a fairly straightforward story. Like it never, it never really slipped into fantasy. Um, yeah, I know like you haven't seen any of the other Stoshi Khan films, so this was kind of your first. Yeah, like, I mean, it wasn't really something I would usually go to as a, an anime film, to be honest, but once, once I went, uh, I was I, I totally loved the film. Yeah, I was really by the end of it. I was like, "This is amazing," and it was so it was so kind of soppy and cheesy, <laughs> and a bit kind of hard to believe with so much coincidence in it. Yeah, but it worked so well, and through the animation, it still had that sense of realism to it. Yeah, there were some, yeah, some amazing shots in this. I think we said when we came out of the the theatre, yeah. the shots of like Tokyo night life or night nightscapes, like yeah, they, scenes. It really captured like what it's like to be in Tokyo. Yeah. There was a lot of, like, nightlife and skyscrapers and maybe, like, what it's like to be kind of homeless and and that's such a big city and how they're looked upon by other people within the city. That's the thing. One of the things about his direction was he used a lot of shots where you could see a lot... There was a lot of action going on in the background, so it was kind of every moment of the film you're seeing things in the background which is giving you a sense of Tokyo whether it's like shops or people walking around or customers so you re- like the whole world seems alive yeah. whereas in some animation you'd maybe see just the main characters on screen and not a lot around them so you don't get a sense of the world whereas this did a great job of like building that world up uh, yeah some of his like direction I thought was really good uh, such as one standout scene that I, I really loved was the scene of a girl uh, in a phone box and the camera kind of cuts back and you see her isolated in the middle. And yeah, he really used direction to move the narrative forward, move the story forward in a way which is not maybe not done that often. People don't, people maybe don't often think about the way that like the shots can also help Push, push the story forward or push the themes forward. I mean, I especially wouldn't associate that with a, with an animation film as well. To be honest with you, like really good direction, but there is parts of it that just look like, really, really beautiful. Like, as like even just like close ups of a fountain. Yeah. Or like just the sunset or something. Just really kind of. Yeah, like the scene, the scene of the sunset was really good, yeah. and you could tell, like with a lot of shots, he'd taken the time to think, what's the best shots? Like, what's the best yeah. way I could, I could kind of frame this. 
Which is one thing like that you can do, do, I guess, with animation maybe easier than live action is you can... Well, you could do a sunset a lot easier. <laughs> you, <laughs> you don't have to wait. You're not restricted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But with animation, like, I think it's something that's often underappreciated that, yeah, when, when you're animating, you could literally choose any shot you like yeah. and and have it set and have it acted however you want, yeah. uh, which this film really does uh, quite well. But after seeing Tokyo Godfathers, I, I, I would really... I would go and see anything else that, that the director's done yeah. because it was that good. Well, I would recommend, like, the other two. I know uh, Perfect Blue... Uh, that was the film which uh, Black Swan was based on. I think Darren Aronofsky bought, even maybe bought the rights to that film so he could make Black Swan. Because the, yeah, the whole premise of the film is very similar to Black Swan. And I heard also uh, Paprika inspired a lot of things such as Inception and these kind of mind-bending action action films. Well, the screening we saw had a little talk at the start of it. Yeah. And the guy, the guy that's lectures in, in Japan. Yeah, that's just film in Japan. He was uh, he was saying basically Christopher Nolan completely ripped off Paprika, <laughs> and nobody cares about that. But if it'd been other way around, it would have been there'd been a huge outcry yeah. in the film community. Well, that's like the that. thing. There's a lot of uh, yeah Western films that rely heavily on uh, Japanese influences, such as um, The Matrix relied quite heavily on Ghost in the Shell. That like borrowed a lot of things from Ghost in the Shell. But what I heard was Ghost in the Shell also borrowed heavily from things like Blade Runner and uh, Neuromancer, the William Gibson yeah. book. So it's kind of a Well this is this is also borrowed from from John, <laughs> John, yeah, John Ford's Ford. Western. Yeah. And and a, and a novel. So as it's well kind of a, yeah, it's kind of a symbiotic yeah. relationship, I guess. It works both ways. Uh, I hadn't really seen the paprika connection, but yeah, when you think about it, I suppose it it was kind of similar. But yeah, I would recommend like his other films as well. Uh, they're very different from this, but like still great direction and great ideas. Um, yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about the themes that were in the in the film? Um, uh, we might get into spoilers in this section a little bit for anyone who hasn't seen seen it, but we'll try and avoid them as much as possible. Uh, well, I just well, it's obviously like got the kind of the kind of Christmas feel to it. Yeah. It could be a Christmas movie. Maybe not everyone's idea of a Christmas movie. Did you think the film was had overly religious connotations? The opening part of the film, not they're really. they're at a Christmas service, I think, and they're talking yeah. and they're mentioning Jesus. They're mentioning like Christmas miracles and the spirit of Christmas. Um, but yeah, after that, I felt like they didn't really. It really stick goes with into that. the background. Yeah, but yeah, to to begin with, it's really. I was I was kind of like, oh, this is going to be a really kind of religious. <laughs> Religious movie. They're at a church. They're you know. That was one coming. of the things that shocked me most when I when the film started because from his other films I hadn't really thought that he was that religious. But then when this started, I was like, oh, he must really kind of believe in like Christianity and things. I it kind of had that, but like it also had the kind of it had that Christmas feel to it, but also had the kind of polar opposite with it being like the the characters were homeless and stuff. Yeah, that kind of took it away from that because it's like it's not necessarily what you think about Christmas time. You're yeah. thinking Christmas movies. You're thinking happy people, turkeys, and I suppose there's a lot of jokes in the film about the the characters are constantly encountering situations where they have incredible luck or they're very lucky, very mm. fortuitous. And there's the constant joke of yeah, but you're all homeless. Like you're yeah. not really that lucky because <laughs> yeah. you're homeless. But especially Hannah really kind of believes in this. Like, Christmas miracle, yeah, the Christmas yeah. miracles and constantly saying, "Oh, how, we're really lucky," and the other two are saying, "Like, well, we're we're still on the street, we're still suffering here." There is lots of coincidence, yeah, throughout the throughout the movie, which gets the which it, I, th- I think if it had been done in a non animated way, I would just be sitting and going, "Oh, I'm not enjoying this at all. This is so <laughs> sloppy, so so cheesy." But with the animation, it works really well, and I think like the voice actors helped with that too. Yeah, but. Like they can add it to it a lot, but yeah, it was just there was so much coincidence yeah. to the point that you'd be like, ah, oh, but it works, it does work. I think the thing was uh, with the religious themes, uh, they kind of carried it through with the theme of coincidences happening throughout the movie, which you're left to make up your own mind of are they kind of fated to succeed here? Like, because they're yeah. almost everything kind of goes goes their way, and they keep getting so lucky in finding, like, the next stage on their path. Is that kind of question, is it, is it really a miracle? Is this really, like, is this child really special? Yeah. In a kind of Christmas but kind I, of way? I liked or it. Or is like, it just I'm, life? 
Yeah, like, I'm not religious at all, but, like, this movie, it doesn't push the religion down your throat and say, look, this is, God is deciding these events and he's, like, guiding these people through. But it just shows you these incredible things happening and uh, kind of says, what, like, what do you make of that? What's your opinion on what you've just seen or what's just happened? Um, yeah, but like you say, as well as, like, themes of Christmas and uh, family, it also has a lot of, like, darker themes maybe like homelessness and gambling and shows a shows a darker side of tokyo yeah than you might see in than you might see in some other films but that like the, with the with the family thing um it was interesting that they were already like we said before already a family but mm. in a kind of very different way as to what you'd associate with a christmas movie yeah like with a cuz i mean gin could almost be like the father figure between the the three main characters, mm. and you've got Hannah, who's a transvestite, and she's just wanting to be the mother. She's kind of mother Miyuki, and yeah. she wants to keep the baby. And Miyuki's kind of adopted them as as almost father and mother figures. Yeah. And when she she does even in a kind of flashback moment, yeah, they kind of revert into that. Yeah, she kind of imagines yeah. them as her, uh, yeah, they as her father and yeah. mother. So it's like there is that always almost a I mean, I would, of strange way. Another thing that surprised me about the film is not it's not a particularly long film. I think it is about ninety minutes yeah. or hundred minutes. But they managed to fit so much yeah. into it. Like all of these characters are fully fleshed out. Uh, like I said before, with family lives and their own interests and their own things they need. But you just discover it as it as it goes along. Like yeah. it's kind of. To begin with, it's just like three homeless people or two homeless people to begin with. But then as it goes on, you just find out more and more about them and what's true and what's lies and yeah, what they've kind of constructed as their identity and if it really is what, what, how they really are. Yeah, but they're, they're, like, their characterization I thought was really good as well. Like even from like the very first scene when you see them, you get an instant sense of, okay, I've pretty much pinned down these characters, what they're like yeah. and what their interests are. Um but yeah, a lot of humour throughout. Like it maybe sounds as though this is kind of a pretty deep, a deep <laughs> but was, film, but it's not. There's so many, there's so many like there's comedies that don't have as many jokes as this. Yeah, like, there's so many jokes in it, and I, didn't, I wasn't expecting that when I went to see it either. Uh, but I didn't really know what it was about. There are a lot to, of to be honest, but yeah, it was it was it was, it was there was plenty of jokes. There in are a lot of jokes. Written. There are a lot of jokes in this, uh, and a lot of jokes that I think you may maybe an over uh, generalization, but you maybe wouldn't see in American films or even British mm. films, like some dark humor. They got away with a lot more, but that could also be to do with animation. Yeah, and I also, think it's animation, yeah. but also partly culture. I think yeah. they like some of the darker jokes were like, yeah. yeah. Things that would uh, probably surprised would surprise a lot of people, yeah, especially like some of the some of the. I mean, the, the way, way they, they refer to each other in certain ways. Yeah, the way they refer to the transvestite character, particularly, I, I can't. I wouldn't have imagined that they would after be after the watershed that they would be, that they would be allowed to put that in. But, but the, also, the that way, was the thing. The, the thing way they were just that, with each other, though, even like just the way they interacted with all three of them with each other was kind of like you wouldn't really get away with that. And all the, that the thing with that was also like we're watching it with subtitles on uh, with the Japanese, like what they were actually saying. It is slightly offensive, but in Japan they don't really have the same kind of offensive insults that we have. So the way that it was translated was a really offensive word, maybe to us. But in Japan, that's not that offensive. So mm. some of it might have been, yeah, just a difference between cultural yeah. like appreciation. It's, ne- of it's these never words. really, be, it's never really been overdubbed, has it? Like properly, it's just subtitled. Yeah, we just watched the subtitled version. I don't, I don't, I don't know, know if there is a dubbed version. A dubbed version. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's probably it might be because of like the just the subject matter and what it's talking yeah. about homeless people. I mean, I always. Yeah, I always prefer to watch the subtitle version than the dubbed version because yeah. it's usually yeah, like, better. I th- yeah, I thought, like, I, I, I thought they're usually close. That. Yeah, they're usually closer to what, like, what they're actually saying. And I feel like you would have lost a lot of the, what the, vo- the original voice actors were kind of getting across because even like if you didn't understand, if you didn't understand Japanese, if you don't speak Japanese, just from the kind of inflections they put on certain things, and the, <laughs> you still got a lot out of it. Yeah, they did a really good job. Like all the characters yeah. were, yeah, kind of hilarious. Yeah. Especially, yeah, especially the Hannah character I really thought was funny. Like, she occasionally, like, stops to do haikus or something. or mm. And she has a very, 
yeah, she's very up and down. Like, she suddenly, t- like, gets very angry about things or, like, suddenly very motherly, like, ch- changing mm. a lot. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, so uh, do you think you'd recommend it to anyone? Um, I think you should watch it if, if you like a comedy, if you like Christmas movies or anime or Tokyo, really. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I like before I would really associate a kind of feature length animation for, as a kids film, but yeah, maybe that's just being me. But like after seeing this, I, I would really recommend anything. Well, it's like the guy said. Uh, I think, like we say, we watched it, and there was a yeah film lecturer who did an introduction for yeah. it. And most people uh, think of like Ghibli films, the mm. Hayao Miyazaki films, when they think of animation. So even though those are all fantastic films, those are more aimed towards kids. Whereas Toshi Kon's films are. One hundred percent films for adults. Yeah, after after I've seen after I've seen this, like I would I would totally check out anything that Satoshi Kon's done because it was that good. Like, and I wasn't really expecting it to be that blown away by it. Yeah, because it, like I said, it wasn't something I would really go and see. But after seeing it, I was totally converted. Yeah. to like I was like, this can still be like a really powerful film and just, just talk a lot about a lot of different things in a really su- good successful way. Yeah. Yeah, he is a really good director. Yeah, I would say the same. Like, I would definitely recommend this film. I wouldn't, I wouldn't to say anyone really. I wouldn't say it's for kids though. No, th- this film isn't yeah. for kids. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's for. Like, I mean, if you're think if you're associating it with animation for kids, I wouldn't say it's for kids. Like this, like we're saying before, like in a darker subject matter. Um. Yeah, I don't know, but then I I'm fairly lenient. Like I'd like kids yeah. watching <laughs> watch anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. I mean the. F- yeah, like, compared... Perfect Blue is definitely a film for adults. Like, I mean, that shouldn't be watched by anyone under under 18. <laughs> Paprika, from what I remember of Paprika, that was kind of a kid's film. Had a real kind of funny, bright sensibilities to it. This one, like, it does cover difficult themes, but I thought it did it in a way which kids could appreciate. Yeah, I know, it was still, like, a really good... Cri- I mean, I popped this on at Christmas, you know, like, yeah. family round... That's the thing, I think it was just maybe intended to be like a good Christmas film. A really feel-good film. Yeah. Like, ridiculously. <laughs> ridiculously feel-good film. That was the thing, it's like, uh, as as it went on, you started getting more and more invested in them, as like, as it went on. And I think that was to do with, like, each kind of scrape they got into, and each time they managed to find, like, a little bit further. It was just structured perfectly, so you, like, it kept, like, drawing you, like, a little bit closer, a little mm. bit closer... And then, like, at the end, hits you with a kind of really emotional ending. Yeah. But by that time, you're so invested that you're just quite shocked, just left <laughs> speechless by, oh, wow, that was quite a pa- powerful, yeah. powerful film. And even at the end, of, like, the, the, is it the skyscrapers are all kind of dancing around. Yeah. It just is a total feel-good. <laughs> but, I mean, again, it's such a kind of dark thing, because it's just, like, three homeless people that have had really kind of tough yeah. lives. It's kinda, so it's kind of got that kind of binary thing it kinda, it's really the, happy but it's quite sad. Yeah, in a way the film like makes you believe the unbelievable. By the yeah. end of the film like so many things have happened which you just... You believe, yeah, if, you believe if in you, a Christmas miracle. If you'd have been told it at the start you would have been like no, that's never going to happen. Yeah. But because the way the film's structured by the end you're like completely willing to believe that and, ex- and accept it. Uh, so yeah, definitely I would definitely recommend this film to people. Yeah, we'd to- fantastic. We'd completely recommend Tokyo Godfathers. Look out for our next review of The Lobster.